Hi everyone, welcome to the third breakout session, um, the five whys of creating safe zone spaces in the, work by, in the workplace by Amy Klein. This session is about to gain better understanding of the importance of creating inclusive spaces for the LGBTQ community through videos, activities, and discussions aimed to give you some ideas you could bring back to incorporate to your own workplace. Please welcome Amy. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Yeah, everybody's belly full. Always love going after lunch as opposed to before lunch. Um, as long as you don't feel like it's nap time. Hopefully um, we'll be a little bit more interactive so that won't be the case. Next slide, please. I don't want to see my picture on there. Oh, we have a clicker for you, sorry. Oh, a clicker. Uh, let's hope I can do this right. Ah, okay. Um, so, if you turn it on and off on the side, you should reset it. Sometimes it times out. Okay. There you go. Good deal. Magic. Uh, magic. Okay. So, my name is Amy Klein. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, Currently, I work at Misericordia University. I'm the director of the Student Success Center there. Um, I've been there for a year and four months. Prior to that, I worked at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine for 10 years. Prior to that, I worked at Luzerne County Community College for 10 years, hence the gray hair. So I've been in higher education for over 20 years now. Um, and I primarily focus on student support, academic success, and things such as that. Um, for the past five years, I've been trained to do safe zone training, ally training, and microaggression training. Okay, so why do I tell you all of that? Who cares? Okay, I don't like to talk about myself. Uh, but the reason why I tell you that is because I am not an expert, and I don't claim to be an expert. Uh, this is going to be hopefully more of a conversation and just some sharing of some information. Okay, so because I'm an educator, we like to give a little bit of um, signpost as far as what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, yay, we can check off number one, I introduce myself. Um, learning objectives, because we always need to have goals. We're actually just going to have one for this session, which is even nicer. Um, group norms, just really quickly, just laying some common expectations down. Um, the bulk of it will be the five W's and the how, although we'll mix up the order a little bit there. Um, and then always questions, um, doesn't have to be saved to the end, can be whenever. And then just some references and resources as if you want some more information. Okay, so one learning objective. Um, I put will um, because that is my hope that you'll gain a better understanding of why it's important to have safe spaces for the LGBTQ community. Now, I was specifically asked to focus on that particular group, but really um, what we'll talk about today, we can apply that to any marginalized group. We don't have to specifically talk about safe spaces for a particular community. So anybody that would be considered marginalized. Okay, so these are some group norms that I usually like to lay out at the beginning of all my training sessions. And the reason why is because if we're talking about creating safe spaces, we should probably create a safe space to start with, right? So there's 10, so it looks a little long, but it's not actually that long. Um, so the first one is be smarter than your phone. Okay, see what I did there? Smartphone? Yeah, I know, not that clever, but um, I understand, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're all super important people and very, very busy. Um, so I appreciate if you have a call that you need to take, but if you can just maybe either mute or silence or just put your phone on vibrate. If you need to take it, go ahead and then just join us when you're able to do so. But I can appreciate that that um, unfortunately, the world doesn't stop when we're in um, certain spaces. Um, the second one is one that I got from my mentor back in 2017 when she joined the medical college when I was there. 
Um, and it's something that sometimes I need to remind myself about because I had never been that way. Um, being comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So if you don't have that mindset, you're not going to grow, you're not going to learn, you're not going to um, educate yourself to do better and to be better. Um, so sometimes in some of these spaces, it, it is a little challenging, it is a little uncomfortable, but that's how we grow. Um, three, co-construct knowledge. Like I said, not an expert, don't claim to be, not a doctor, just play one on TV. So what I hope is that we'll have a little bit of a dialogue, right, where um, I can share information with you and then hopefully you can reciprocate because I usually learn as much from the participants. Um, and I'm not here to change your mind. I really am not, that's not my job. Um, what I'm here to do is share um, the knowledge that I have and my lived experiences and hopefully um, you'll get something out of that. And if not, at least you're able to hang out just for 45 minutes. Um, confidentiality, super important. I want you, if you hear something or something sparks um, an idea, I want you to take that back to your spaces with you, right? Um, but if someone shares an experience, we don't need to attach a name to it. So I want people to feel comfortable sharing experiences with the knowledge that no one's gonna go out and kinda broadcast that anywhere, except for on live stream. Okay. Um, LOL. So, being that I'm in education for as long as I am, I like to think I'm hip, but I know I'm not. Um, but I don't think anyone says LOL anymore, but I do. So sometimes we get super serious about some of these topics, and rightfully so, right? Some of this stuff is, is mind-blowing as far as um, the injustice and the discrepancies. But sometimes we can still kind of laugh at either a situation or ourselves, as long as we're not laughing at others. Um, six questions, questions, questions. Please ask or contribute if you have um, some opinions. Uh, reserve the right to change your mind. That comes along with co-constructing knowledge, right? So if you come prepared to listen with an open mind, sometimes that might, what you hear might change um, what you previously thought. And that's, you know, that's another growth mindset. Share the airtime. Um, if you're someone that likes to share, make sure you monitor and, and allow for others to be heard because everyone's invited to the table so we want to make sure everybody has the right to be heard um, suspend judgment that's the open-mindedness and then use i statements sometimes when we share information it comes across as fact if we don't say i think i feel i believe so if you have something to say and it um, is more opinion based if you can just make sure you preface it Okay, so who are we talking about? Okay, so specific, specifically today, we are gonna be talking about the LGBTQ community, but this applies to all marginalized groups. Okay, so what's a marginalized group? So this is the wheel of power and privilege. Has anyone seen this before? Okay, so basically the way it works is the categories are around the outside, and then the groups that are closer to the outside are the marginalized groups. And then the closer you get to the center, the power is, that's where the power and the privilege is held, okay? And the um, sources is located on the bottom there. So specifically, we're gonna be talking about gender and sexuality, but obviously there's a lot more um, categories available. So, and the interesting thing is, right, that a person can be in a privileged group and separately somewhere else in a marginalized group, right? Okay, so if you haven't guessed, I'm white, okay? So that's a privileged group, but I'm also cisgender and I'm a female, okay? Cisgender is also a privileged group, female, not so much. Some of the other spaces I'm in though, my privilege or my marginalization can kind of vary, which would be, you know, when I'm at school, my education, depending on who I'm with, 
it can, and also my position at school, depending on who I'm with or the spaces that I'm in, can be part of the privileged group or the marginalized. So sometimes those spaces are a little challenging to navigate. Okay. So what we're talking about specifically is the LGBTQ community. Okay. So the LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, the Q, queer, but in some cases questioning. Questioning means that they're still exploring. So if you picture it, because visuals are always helpful, like an umbrella, okay? And the queer is the non-heterosexual, non-cisgender overarching category of the umbrella, okay? And then where the handle is divides sexualities and genders, okay? And this is not an exhaustive list by any means. So you have um, lesbian, gay, bisexual sexualities. There's other sexualities that I kind of put on the side, and that's not exhaustive. And then the, on the other side of the handle, you have genders, which is um, transgender, you have cisgender, genderqueer, and many, many more as well. But this is just to give you a little visual, because I think sometimes language can be very confusing to people, and people are so afraid that they're gonna make mistakes. But again, growth mindset, that's how you learn. Okay. okay. Can you cue up the video? This might help a little bit. Has anyone seen this before? Okay, it's about seven minutes. But this helps with um, understanding a little bit of language. Give me one second. Oh, I will give you one second. Should I, should I sing? I, you don't want me to sing. That would be. We do use the. ¿Cuándo fue la última vez que viste un pro? Um, simple overview. Now, some you heard some of the words in there. Um, that's not even kind of scratching in the surface. There's other things in there as what as well. Um, if we can go to the next. That's me. Never mind. Okay. So. Hopefully that made things a little bit clearer. We go over in um, Safe Zone Training a whole like section on vocab and we kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive. And I wanna talk a little bit later, of, <clears throat> excuse me, about language because things that maybe were, had a negative connotation now have a positive connotation and vice versa. Kind of like the word queer. Um, when I was growing up, that was a derogatory term but the um, queer community has taken that word and used it as an empowering, affirming word, but not all of the LGBTQ community um, uses that term. So um, you would never label someone that way. If they identify that way, then that would be acceptable. Okay, so what I wanna talk about next are just some of the stats, the data, just a, qu a few quick facts. Usually when I did this um, at the med school, it was more around healthcare because that's what the students were kind of focusing on. But I found some interesting numbers. Um, so I went to the LGBT map website and I put in Pennsylvania because when I woke up this morning, that's the state I was in. So um, I just used that. You can go and put in information on any state. Um, so the percent of adults, and they consider adults 18 and older, um, I worked at college forever, I don't consider 18 year olds adults, but we'll pretend they are, um, who are LGBTQ. And this was, um, the Williams Institute did a survey back in 2019, that was the most recent data they had, and it was 4.1%. Um, interestingly enough, they did another survey in 2021 of the United States and it was about 4.5%, okay? Um, almost half a million uh, total LGBTQ population, that's 13 and older. My guess is that's who they surveyed. Um, obviously there are um, those younger that identify that way. Um, total LGBTQ workers, is about um, 300,000, and that equates to about 5% of the workforce in the state. Now keep in mind, 
these numbers are reported numbers, right? So they didn't survey every single person in Pennsylvania, and they didn't um, maybe always have people that felt comfortable responding as their authentic selves. So my guess is these numbers are higher, okay? And so why does this matter? Well, because these are <clears throat> friends, family, partners, coworkers, et cetera, et cetera. So it does matter. It definitely does matter. Um, some other statistics, well, data, that things that maybe just to put things in perspective that in some ways we've come far, but in some ways really we haven't considering, you know, the history, how long we've been here, at least in the United States. So um, the first support group or advocacy um, for the LGBTQ community was back in 1924, okay? So only about 100 years ago. Very short-lived because obviously <clears throat> ran into a lot of harassment and discrimination. Um, Stonewall riots, I don't know if any of you are familiar with those. Um, I wasn't alive at the time, pretty close, not alive at the time. Um, it's Stonewall Inn in New York City where the police came and raided. That was kind of the start of the gay rights movement. Um, 1971 is when the first legislation uh, towards gay rights took place, and that was out in Illinois. Um, 1973, and this one was interesting to me because it's literally only 50 years ago, was when they took homosexuality, which I'm not a fan of the term, but they took homosexuality out of the um, DSM which right now it's DSM-5, but I'm guessing back then it was like four or three, and that's the American Psychiatric Association. So they classified it prior to that as a mental illness. Like only 50 years ago did they decide, okay, maybe that's not the case. So, I mean, we've come far, but we have a lot further to go. But obviously um, that marginalized community experiences a lot of discrimination um, and has excessive um, percentages of poverty, homelessness, mental health issues, um, suicide, unfortunately. Okay, so why? Okay, why is this something that we should be looking at? I'm counting. <laughs> okay, so if you could get into pairs with somebody that you, and I see you two looking at each other, that you don't know or don't know that well, I would appreciate it. So if you could just partner up with somebody. Um, before you chat with them, though, what I want you to do, um, does everybody have a pen? Okay. What I want you to do is I want you to fill out this piece of paper, and um, hopefully nobody's done it before, but if you have, so there's three, there's four questions, three responses for each question, okay? If you can't come up with three, don't stress out about it. It's not the end of the world. So, who are the three most important people in your life? Okay. And just do it by yourself first, okay? D don't discuss with anyone else yet. Okay. What are the three groups you're involved with? And that can be religious, social, work groups. What three things do you most like to talk about? And then what three things do you spend the majority of your time doing? Okay, so don't just do it, you know, if, we, if we're odd number, um, we can have a triad, that's fine. Okay, but if you can just take like a couple minutes. Okay, so, and usually these, the ones that come the fastest are the ones that I would suggest going with. Who are the three most important people in your life? What groups are you involved with? What three things do you most like to talk about? And what three things do you spend the majority of your time doing? Hopefully fun stuff, but.
If you can't think of three, that's okay. Two is good, three is better. And then just look up when you're done. And for those of you watching, you can do the same. Everybody almost done. I think, like anything, like work, yeah, you can just translate it, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't have to be school related. Okay, good, everybody good? Okay, so what I want you to do in your, in your pairs is pick somebody to be um, person A and pick somebody to be person B and then for the triad a C um, person A is going to go first then B and then C um, and what you're going to do is you're going to talk about yourself you're going to introduce yourself to the other person okay and you're going to have a minute to do that and then we'll switch the person who's introducing themselves the other person should just listen Really don't, you know, don't interject if you can avoid it. Okay, but the caveat is you cannot talk about anything that you wrote down. Okay, so anything that you have on that paper, you can't bring up at all. Okay, so you want to introduce yourself, you want to talk about yourself, but nothing on that paper. Okay, so whoever's person A, okay, ready, start. Okay, stop. Okay, now switch. Okay, now person B. Ready? Start.
Okay, stop. Okay. Now person C, you're in the spotlight, go ahead. Okay, so let's bring it back to the larger group. Okay, what was that like? Hard, difficult? Okay, okay. So what kinds of things did you talk about? Your cat, okay. Gardening? Okay, demographic information, what else? Okay, where you were from. Okay, so thinking about the person that you just met, how did they seem? Very uncomfortable? Okay. Okay. Would this be a person that you might develop a further relationship with? Okay. Okay, so very nice surface level information. Okay. How challenging was it to come up with stuff to say? Okay, very. Why? Yeah. Yeah. something that's very natural, conversational, something that obviously you talk about quite often. It's a really integral part of your life, right? Okay. Being an introvert, I have like, when I meet people, I have a few go-tos. So that, that I'd lock up. I'd have, oh, talk, talk about the weather, right? Okay. So that was just a little sample, obviously, but why did we do that? Yeah. Excellent, right? Because when we go into a space, initially we don't know how we're going to be received. We don't know if we can be our, th our authentic selves. So think about how much energy that took for you to like rack your brain to think of stuff. That's how people in the LGBTQ community that are navigating spaces that are new or different feel all the time. You know, can't can't really decide off the top of their head if they can be their authentic self. And how do you think that impacts their work then? Like, right? Think about it. Like, if you can't bring your authentic self to work, how are you going to be creative? How are you going to be, like, amazing and just, like, this force to be reckoned with if you can't be? So... That's, that's why we do that, and it's just a small piece. Obviously, you can't put yourself in someone else's experience, but it's just to give you a little taste. Okay. So where? Where can we create these safe spaces? And obviously, we're focusing around the workplace, but it can really be anywhere. So this hot mess is um, my office. So the first picture, there are three pictures. The first picture is right outside the door of my office, okay? So, and I'm, I apologize for my phone quality. But at the bottom, I have a laminated card that says, Misericordia University, safe space. So uh, just a little something so people know whoever comes into my office 
that they're coming into a safe space um, where they're valued, they're heard, and they're respected. The middle picture is my door, and, it ha and I know I can't read the text, but it has, I'm a safe person, celebrate diversity, and then the bottom one is um, a little explanation about what inclusion is, okay? And that's right on my door. Um, and in, on the corner there, you can see um, Archie McGrowl is our um, mascot, and that's his foot. He's a cougar. Um, <laughs> and then on the end, um, which I apologize for the flag in the way, but that's behind, my desk faces the door, and then that's behind me on the wall, and it says um, diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. Um, and I don't put this stuff up for show. Like, I really do um, make sure that mostly students come into my office, but I do have the occasional staff and faculty member that this is a safe space. Um, you're going to be heard, you're going to be respected, you're going to be understood. Um, and again, that by no means makes me an expert, but they're comfortable doing that. Um, I liked what was said earlier about it needs to, it needs to be part of the culture, right? It can't just be one person. I mean, it can start with one person, certainly, but it just can't be one person. I don't necessarily know if it always has to start with leadership, but somehow it needs to be up in leadership, whatever organization you work for. They have to really embrace that as part of the culture. Um, and if you can see the mission statement of Misericordia University, we went through a little mission refresh. So next year we're, ce we're celebrating our centennial, so 100 years, which is super cool because the place that came from before that hasn't even been around for 20 years, which is still cool, right? But to be at um, an institute of higher education that has such a rich history um, is amazing. So the, ref the refresh of the mission was just to maybe update the words, but the sentiment is still the same. So is your organization's mission and values supporting that inclusive culture, that safe space? Um, and ours definitely does. We have core values. We call them charisms. Um, mercy, service, justice, and hospitality, um, and the justice is social justice, and we really do um, every decision that's made, every strategic plan that comes out um, is mission-centric and mission-driven and ties in, and if it doesn't tie in, it's not an initiative or a priority. Um, other places that you can think of would be maybe um, in your email tag, right? I have my pronouns. Um, in, in my email tag. When I introduce myself, I introduce myself with my pronouns. I don't expect others to do the same. Some people aren't comfortable doing that, okay? So if, but pe that lets people know that I'm comfortable sharing those. If you're comfortable, that's fantastic. Um, another place potentially could be in meeting spaces. Not only making sure that the right people are invited to the table, right, because you know, who's making these decisions, it needs to be um, the right people being invited to the table and being heard and respected and seen, but also, like I did in the beginning with the group norms, like establishing group norms. Like, that's a fantastic way to, do, to just create a safe space. What's discussed here, you can be confident in knowing that, you know, you're not going to be judged or it's not going to be taken to another level or what have you. Um, any other spaces where you've either attempted to create a safe space or where you could think might be a good place for, the safe, for a safe space in your workplace? Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic, having committees and having, um, for us it would be clubs. And I remember Jacob had mentioned in another session about policies, right? Are you putting that in your policies and procedures as well? What's the language that you're using there? Okay, yes.
Yeah, 100%. Having those safe spaces created, those physical spaces created, yes. I, that's totally a space. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to um, be creative. Don't think necessarily physical, but yes, language on forms. I know that was a big one um, when I worked at the med school because, you know, students are in the clinical space and they go and, you know, what, you know, what's the genders that you have listed on the form? Okay, Geisinger is actually really progressive, so that's a little bit different, but like potentially if they go to another space, but that's a really good one. And that brings up the point of language because you, know, you create space with your language. Okay, that's a lot of text. Um, these are just some, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just some things, like when I said before where things were acceptable at one point, maybe not so much now or vice versa. So saying hermaphrodite. Um, totally unacceptable. Okay, that has a very negative connotation to it. Um, typically, it was used in the medical setting, and I think that's why it gained uh, a negative connotation. Um, homosexual. I know they send it on the gen gender bread cookie. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the word, only because sometimes it's weaponized when it's used. So you can use other language there. Um, born female, born male, female-bodied, male patty, assigned at birth, that's typically what you say. Um, a gay or a transgender, um, they're not an object, they're not a thing, they're a human being, a person. Um, if you go further down the list, the ones at the bottom are not the last one, that's um, not, but um, ladies and gentlemen. So. This is one that's probably just a common mistake because people are so used to it, right? Um, so when you're saying ladies and gentlemen, men and women, you're basically excluding um, a group of people. So you wouldn't want to do that. Another popular one that I hear all the time is guys, okay? Hey guys, okay. My students say it all the time and I'm like, how about we, how about we don't? You know, there's other words that we can use. Um, you're paying a lot of money good to go to college, so let's use some better vocab. Um, but I think part of it just is that people get so afraid, but if you ask or if you make a mistake, just acknowledging that and just being like, thank you, thank you for, um, thank you for um, educating me. I'll do better next time. Okay, so when? When is a good time to create these safe spaces? I don't know that there's necessarily ever a bad time. I think, you know, any time is a good time. But when you're doing this, um, whether it's in your own space or you're bringing it to a larger um, company or organizational situation, you just need to make sure that the message is, con like, consistent, right? Like, we all know... You know, May 31st, things are pretty chill. June 1, everything's rainbow, just for a month. So, you know, is that really part of the culture if you're putting up a flag for 30 days and then taking it down? Um, not that you don't want to celebrate Pride Month, but if that's the only time you're celebrating, that might be a little problematic, okay? So, you don't have to read all those. Um, this is just talking about coming out. So when someone comes out to you in the workplace or anywhere, but obviously we're talking about the workplace, don't assume that they're out in other places. Out is typically not one and done, unless maybe you're a celebrity and you're on social media every there and then like everybody kind of, you just do it and it's, it's kind of the out there in the universe. But typically for the LGBTQ community, it's, it's a decision that they constantly are making. You know, do I feel safe? Do I feel comfortable? Do I want to be out in this particular space? Okay, so, and I've had students that I've worked with that came out to me, which I was very honored um, that they trusted me, but they, they confided in me. They weren't out to their parents or they weren't out to, um, you know, people back home or, or what have you. So you can't ever assume 
um, that someone who's out with you is out everywhere. Um, and these, whoops, got a little trigger happy. Um, these are just some do and don'ts. They're not really, it's not, a, an, again, an exhaustive list. We don't have um, the time for that. But, um, you know, they're still the same person. This is, this does not necessarily define them. This is, it's a part of them. It's a very important part of them that they're sharing with you. Um, and usually what I would do is just ask, how can I support you? Like, what can I do um, to better support you? It's sometimes they know and sometimes they don't know, and, and we work on it together. Okay, so how? How do we go about creating these spaces? Whoops. Again, got a little trigger, Abby. So how? How do we do that? Where do we start? Maybe training. That's always a good place to start, right? Just kind of sharing information and knowledge. Um, I'll show you the Safe Zone web so website. I'm almost wrapping up now. Um, the Safe Zone project is a really cool project. <clears throat> the, one of the co-creators, Meg Bolger, came to um, the med school back in 2017, and she did, I believe it was three days, pretty intensive train the trainer for this two-hour program, and it was phenomenal. And then what we did was we trained all the students, all the incoming students. We kind of brought it out eventually to um, the healthcare system as well, but it was, um, the best part about it is all the information on the website is free, so you don't have to pay for it. Now that doesn't mean I'd suggest you download a packet and just hand it to everybody, be like, there you go, figure it out. Um, but most of the trainers that are trained um, have absolutely no problem coming into your space and doing it usually at no cost. Um, it really is a great program. It's very um, basic, but it really invites a lot of really good conversation, okay? So that could be a start maybe with that, maybe just little changes, like maybe it could be being more mindful of language, or it could be big changes too, depending upon um, your power and privilege, right? Okay. Does anybody have any suggestions? Yeah. I love that. I love that idea that we somehow acquire this notion in life that we must be perfect and we can't make mistakes and people are, and I think, I think part of that has a little bit to do with social media where you put something out there and people attack you um, for no good reason sometimes. But I agree with that 100%. We're all human. Um, and that's the most important thing. And you you don't have to necessarily understand in order to appreciate. Because maybe sometimes you won't understand, like understand me, like have the knowledge. But having that like gentle curiosity and having that kind of desire um, to learn more and to better yourself, obviously that spreads. Anyone else? Yes. Perfect, like inviting people to the table to collaborate and just communicate, I think is ideal. Because it could be existing. And that could be something, if this is something that you value, if you plan on moving on professionally, that could be something that you consider, right? Like 
do my values align with this institution's values? And like the panel had said earlier, most of that stuff is public. You can, you can research and find out like how do they support marginalized groups? Do they have um, you know, culture committees? Do they have policies in place? And, and just um, different things to make people feel um, included. You know, are there people in power positions that can advocate um, for those marginalized groups as well? Okay, any final thoughts or comments? Um, these, that's the website, the Safe Zone Project, safezoneproject.com, it's not anything uh, too complicated. Um, the Health Education Center is where I just got the data, and then the Jetter Bread Cookie video if you want to YouTube it, okay. There's also um, a really cool video that's related but not related um, about microaggressions and mis microaggressions are like mosquito bites. I love that. I could watch that every day. Um, but if you get a chance, you can Google it and see. Okay, but that's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your collaboration. All right. What did you do, Ahmad? <laughs> All right, well, thank everyone. Thank you to Amy. That was an amazing presentation. And that mosquito video, if you get a chance, is actually really good. I use it all the time. <laughs> um, we're going to take just a quick uh, four or five minutes, run to the bathroom really quickly, and then we'll get everyone.